Actually, thanks everybody. Thanks everybody for taking time out of your day. I know it's hard at 6 30 in the evening. You're getting ready for dinner to hear someone uh, talking about anything. So it's, it's a great privilege to be able to uh, speak here in front of you. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the latest treatments for cardiac arrhythmias. And we're, we're going to focus a little bit on AFib, but be, you know, as general as possible. And the purpose of this really is to just open your minds to, to the concepts of what we're doing and how we're treating, but then really hopefully uh, leave enough time that we can really discuss the specifics if you have questions. Um, and I think that'll be really helpful, uh, you know, in that, uh, in that fashion so that we have the ability to discuss it. These are my disclosures. I do a lot of different research in the space of atrial fibrillation and arrhythmia. Some of it are specifically uh, leading many research trials to look at alternatives to taking anticoagulants to reduce stroke. Some of it are related to catheter ablation with new technologies. So, you know, in terms of what we want to discuss today, I want to start out by really reviewing the heart's electrical system uh, at, at a very low level kind of review. Again, allowing hopefully time to, to have more specific questions in detail, because I think the knowledge base is, it varies with the, with the audience we have here. So we'll talk about that. And I think, you know, I mean, the first step, I think that many people often are challenged to realize is that the heart is an electrical organ. You know, whenever I talk to most patients, their only concern about heart disease is, am I gonna have a heart attack? And we explain to them that that's the plumbing part of the heart. And what we're gonna focus on, and as an electrophysiologist, we specialize in treating the electrical part of the heart. And without electricity, the heart wouldn't be able to beat. And this is kind of an example of, of the electrical wiring inside the heart. Now, every cell in the heart in these four chambers that you see uh, can conduct electricity, but you have special fibers within the chamber that are superconductors that really uh, allow electricity to pass very rapidly, which then make the heartbeat. So if you look at where it all starts, it's that blue dot in the upper left of the heart. This is called the SA node. This is kind of called the pacemaker of the heart. This is what you're born with. And this little area uh, basically uh, determines when and how fast your heart would be, will beat. It makes electricity from scratch and basically shoots electricity into the heart. And you can see that little red dot as the electrical current as it goes into the heart. And this basically goes through specialized fibers down to the very bottom of the heart. And you can see the lower two chambers of the heart are the muscle of the heart. They're the actual pump and they need electricity uh, to, to know when they should squeeze. The problem is they're not very intelligent. So they rely on electricity to come from the upper chambers or the atrium, which then tell it what to do and tell it to squeeze. And only when the lower chamber squeezes, do you get a pulse. And that's kind of how the heart is wired. That's the baseline uh, electrical system of the heart. So then that leads us to what, what is an arrhythmia? Because it, you know when people say, you know when I tell them you have a heart arrhythmia, they again think, oh, I'm gonna have a heart attack. But when I tell them they have an electrical block, they think they have a blockage, uh, which is not the same as a blockage in plumbing. So when we talk about arrhythmia, it means an electrical abnormality in the heart. That means something is not firing in a way that it was uh, it, that it's supposed to, that it's considered normal. And some of it can be just a part of aging, and some of them can actually be, you know, something that could be, you know, wrong that could cause a problem. And the challenge is that sometimes patients can have arrhythmias and not feel it. So just because you don't feel it and you feel okay doesn't mean something isn't wrong, but that doesn't mean that everyone should be fearful that they're going to suddenly have, you know, a major cardiac uh, issue, um, you know, or an event, uh, even though they feel fine. It's just, uh, you know, important to understand the concept that sometimes, you know, the heart can beat very fast called tachycardia. Uh, sometimes the heart can beat very slow called bradycardia. And you know, uh, sometimes a heart can be in kind of the normal range, but still there can be something wrong with it. I'm going to describe what that is. And that's why I think it's important to have routine follow-up with your general physician, your annual visit, or depending if you have a lot of other medical problems to be seen and not kind of just disappear for a couple of years. I know right now it's hard with the pandemic. Everyone's trying to avoid, you know, uh, being out so much and, and be exposed to the potential risk of, of the, you know, the COVID-19. But um, I think depending on how you're doing and what your medical history is, it's important to have regular follow-up. So what are some of the symptoms? And let's start, and this can be 
any kind of electrical problem, any type of arrhythmia. And the problem is all different types of arrhythmias can have the same symptoms. So palpitation or feeling like pounding in your chest or, and, and these can all be also occurring in patients who have nothing wrong with them or no abnormalities, but they may feel this. And that's the challenge, you know, dizziness or feeling lightheaded. Who hasn't ever felt dizzy or lightheaded at least once? You know, fainting, uh, feeling short of breath. Everyone feels short of breath. I typically have the, the most common complaint from my patients who are 95 years old is, doctor, I'm short of breath even though they're 95 or, or they're weak because they're 95. And, and when is it an age related thing or when is it something that's strong? And, the, and these are some of the challenges and these are the things that we're going to talk about, some of the tests that we can do. And sometimes these symptoms can manifest as just having discomfort in the chest. And so, you know, people are confused. Like, is it a blockage? Am I gonna have a heart attack or is this a manifestation of my heart arrhythmia? So these are some of the things that we have to think about. And so what you see here on the bottom is an EKG of the heart, but it, uh, you know, it may not be uh, evident, but that's a very, very slow heartbeat. That pulse uh, is going probably closer to 20 to 30 beats a minute, if actually less than that. So you know, when, when people have a slow pulse, they can be symptomatic, uh, but there is no magic number. So some people say, oh my gosh, my heart rate is down into the 50s at night or 40s at night. Uh, does that mean um, there's something wrong with me? And it's it's not necessarily the case. It really depends on whether the pulse is causing symptoms. So in some patients being 40, they feel horrible. In some patients being 40, they feel fine. And so, you know, it really depends on the individual and the overall health uh, and the specific type of slow pulse that they have. But when they are symptomatic, one can be dizzy. One can feel lightheaded. We talked about fainting. We talked about shortness of breath. We talked about weakness. So again, the same symptoms, uh, but these could be related to a slow pulse. And oftentimes patients just have a slow pulse. You know, there's no magic number here. You know, we tend to believe that if it's less than 60 beats a minute, that's considered a slow pulse. But the reality is that that number between 60 and 100 was an average of, you know, 25 healthy volunteers in 1965 when we kind of came up with that range. If you're physically fit and you're very active, your resting pulse may be slower. If you're out of shape and, and just have are deconditioned, then your resting pulse may be higher. So in and of itself, one shouldn't necessarily be completely freaked out because their pulse seems too slow. It really should be whether it's associated with symptoms. And on the other side, when your pulse is fast, like this person's heart, it's going at 150 beats a minute. You know, you can feel palpitation or feel the fluttering. You can feel like your chest is pounding. Uh, you can feel dizzy again. You can feel shorter breath again. You can have weakness and fatigue. So again, the complete opposite of a slow pulse, a rapid pulse can cause similar symptoms. But if your pulse is 150 because you are running, then that may not be abnormal. But if you're just sitting around doing nothing and your pulse goes to 150, that typically isn't a normal thing. So the symptom that most people get confused about is they say, doctor, you know, my heart is doing something. I think I'm having palpitation. And I say, what do you mean by that? Well, I don't know. That's just a word that everybody uses. And, and what I typically say is, you know, normally we're not aware of our heartbeats. Our heartbeats 100,000 times a day without us actually knowing what's going on. And yet, you know, when you're suddenly aware of your heart, then that may be your first symptom. And so people use this word differently. But the, the question is, are you aware of your heart because you took some stimulant? Are you aware of your heart because you are full of adrenaline because you're scared or you're stressed or a dog was chasing you down the street or you took too much caffeine. So, you know, when it's related to adrenaline release from some, you know, activity or event that happened in your life, that doesn't mean that it's necessarily something is wrong with your heart. It just means that anything that could make your heart race can cause these symptoms. But also, there are patients who feel as though their heart is pounding, and this is a common complaint. You know, I'm just aware of my heart is pounding and squeezing really hard, but it's not fast. You know, and this typically is just related to increased awareness of your heart and anxiety, but this doesn't necessarily mean something is wrong. So again, these are just different examples of when things are normal, but they're considered, patients are considered symptomatic. But you can have the same symptom when there's something wrong with your heart we're gonna talk about extra or skipped beats from different parts of the heart. Uh, we call premature beats or even uh, a complete short circuit of the heart called atrial fibrillation, which we'll talk about. So th this is why it's important when you do have symptoms that we 
often do test to diagnose it. So we, we look at your history. When did it start? Well, it started, you know, it's been since I was a kid and I've had many tests before. Then you're going to say that's probably just some skip beats or it just started happening a week ago. And now I'm really short of breath and I can't do anything. So we're going to listen to your history and then decide what kind of tests we're going to do, invasive or non-invasive. So, you know, we're all familiar with the good old fashioned EKG. And if you look at this image, this was how an EKG was done in the 1940s. This was one of the first EKGs in the country at where I trained at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston at Harvard Medical School. And this is how a patient would have to lay there and put their hands and feet in these uh, salt tanks, uh, salt water tanks, saline tanks to get an EKG. The technology has improved. Now an EKG machine can be pretty small, you know, size of a notebook and you can get an EKG. But what's even really more impressive is now we have these machines that are so tiny that connect to our iPhones or to our, to our smartphones. And you can get an EKG simply by putting two fingers on. So when many of my patients have occasional arrhythmia, I'll ask them to buy that thing and they can buy it online. Um, and it costs, I think, somewhere around 80 bucks. And they can get an EKG whenever they want if they're feeling something wrong. And that's been really helpful. What's even more helpful is now people have the Apple Watch. And the Apple Watch is able to get an EKG, the, the current version of the Apple Watch, just by putting your finger and thumb on it and can get us EKG at any time and can actually monitor your heart. And so a lot of patients are choosing to have this and wear this as their routine daily monitor. So this has really helped a lot. We can even do a 24 hour monitor where you wear these leads on your chest and you wear it for 24 hours and it records everything because it can happen at a random time. You won't even really know what's going on. And there you can see an, an EKG, uh, you know, uh, obtained on a 24 hour monitor. But what's really interesting is our, our next generation technology. Now we can put a sticker on your chest with no wires that basically is waterproof. You can shower with it on and this records your EKG for 24 hours or even up to seven days. And then when the glue comes off, it comes with an envelope that's got its own stamp on it. You put it in your mailbox and it gets mailed away. So this has really allowed us to get more information. And when we have patients who have an event happening once every six months or very infrequently, then we implant this little device called a loop recorder. Here you see how someone had this on for six weeks because they only pass out once every six to eight weeks. And right in the middle there, you can see their heart basically stop for a matter of six seconds. And after that, they ended up getting a pacemaker. But without this kind of monitoring system, we never would have known. And just to show you, this little monitor is about the size of a AAA battery. And this video that you're gonna see shows how this monitor is basically put in under the skin in a matter of about 30 seconds. Okay, so it's very simple uh, how we do this. You basically do this with local. So the patient drives in, uh, we just give a little Novocaine, uh, numb that area, then we basically inject this monitor in in all about 30 seconds and the patients can drive home. And this, these monitors have battery life for over three years uh, to even five years so that it can record your heartbeats 24-7. Uh, and if you have any atrial fibrillation or any kind of arrhythmia or you pass out or you have symptoms and you see how the monitor just disappears under the skin, um, then it'll send us an email alert wirelessly that you had an episode. So that's been really interesting. But when we find that something is wrong, then we really need to do an electrical study of the heart. And that's when we start doing invasive tests. That is, we put in catheters through the vein into the heart. And, you know, most of the time, mild uh, episodes weren't no treatment, but we'll do this test that we showed about where we put the wires inside the heart and measure the electrical system, kind of like an electrician does in your house. Um, you know, when you're checking the light bulb, we can do the same thing. But sometimes patients do have issues and arrhythmias and our treatments can make them feel better and also can make them live longer. And these are the things we think about. Now, going back to treatments, just want to uh, show you some new technology. In the old days, when your heart was too slow, we'd put a pacemaker like you see here in the chest. And it's about the size of a silver dollar and the wire goes directly into the heart and we record electrical signals. And you can see in this video, uh, beating heart, you can see the valve is opening and we're inserting this wire that goes right through the valve. Now, what if I were to tell you that now we can implant a pacemaker without even doing surgery? This is the newest pacemaker. This is, these are the smallest pacemakers in the world. They're leadless pacemakers. They're the size of a large vitamin capsule. And we can implant these in patients now 
without even doing surgery with just some local sedation through the vein in the leg. And this is the concept of how it happens. Uh, what we do is we go through the vein in the leg and we insert this wire. Now the patients are awake, we numb the area with Novocaine. And what you'll see here is we're able to advance this wire directly into the heart, okay? And then what we do is we insert the pacemaker directly into the heart through this catheter, okay? And what we do then is we advance this pacemaker, which again is the size uh, you know, of a vitamin capsule, and we advance it into the heart. And then the pacemaker attaches to the heart. And then we have a little, you see there in the video, and we have a little cord attached to it. And we basically, you see how it attaches to the muscle, we cut the cord and we release the pacemaker, which is then attached to your heart and we can interrogate it. And so now the patient has a pacemaker put in uh, with no wires and no leads because we're gonna cut this cord and remove everything else out of the body, as you see here. Uh, simply take the thread out, we take the catheter out of the leg, and the next thing you know, the patient has a pacemaker. Then the old standard one looked like the one on the left. The new one is a tiny little, looks like a little pellet or a little bullet, which is attached to your heart, battery life of over 10 years. Uh, and patients have no wires, no leads, no surgery, no incision. And here's the size of that thing. You can see relative to a penny how tiny that is. And that's what the x-ray looked like before with the old type. And you see the new one, there's no even evidence, there's not even evidence that you've ever had even a pacemaker put in. So that's kind of cool with new technology. What about when you have the arrhythmias where your heart is short circuiting and going fast? Like we'll talk about atrial fibrillation, but many different tachycardias. Medications can work, but you know, you have to take a medication every day versus, you know, just fixing it. There's very few things in medicine that can be cured. It's very easy for us to say, take this pill for the rest of your life, but we can actually fix the short circuits by using innovative new technology. And this is called ablation, where I can go in from the vein of the leg and insert this catheter into the heart and find the area that's short circuiting and make good contact. And then I can cauterize or burn that area with all of my specialized equipment. And that's called catheter ablation. We can also do that, as you saw with burning, we can do it with freezing. Here we insert what's called a cryo balloon. So we can freeze the areas that are short circuiting also instead of burning. This is for atrial fib. So we're able to go into the heart, uh, find the areas that are short circuiting. And in this case, we're gonna advance a balloon uh, into the heart tissue. And this balloon is gonna inflate and freeze the area that it's touching, okay? And it's gonna uh, basically ablation or destroy that tissue so that none of the short circuits that come from inside the vein and actually come out into the heart and cause atrial fib. So there you see the freezing and you see the balloon. It takes about four minutes of lesion. And then once you deflate the balloon and you remove it and you rewarm, you can see the area around the vein has been ablated. So the short circuits inside never get into the heart. And that's what we do with ablation. The other tachycardia that I think it's important for you to uh, recognize is cardiac arrest or sudden death. More people die every year. Uh, obviously, and this does not include the pandemic situation where we're having a complete change in what's happening. But in terms of heart disease, heart disease hasn't gone away. And half a million people die every year uh, from uh, sudden cardiac death. And what you're gonna see in this video and on the EKG, you can see the heart suddenly shorts out on the very right but you're gonna see a video of a heart that goes on, undergoes cardiac arrest. It starts quivering, it starts shaking, and then just kind of you know, quivers and then just basically stops. So that's, that's called cardiac arrest. Not a blockage, not a heart attack, but an electrical short circuit of the heart. Okay, so if we go to the next slide, you can see uh, what we do trying to, to reduce that risk for someone who's high risk for that is we implant a device called a defibrillator, which is bigger than a pacemaker, has a wire that goes into the heart that can shock the heart back to normal. Here you can see when we're doing open heart surgery, the heart is fibrillating, okay? It's kind of quivering. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna put the paddles on the heart while we're doing surgery and we're gonna give it a shock right here, boom. Now look at the heart squeezing right after that. It's an electrical short circuit that's been fixed. And while that can certainly happen during the procedure, look at something that's really interesting. This next video I'm going to show you is a, a wire in the heart where the heart is short circuiting and you're going to see an electrical shock, which then resets the heart.
and that's supposed to reset the heart, but instead my video is freezing. There we go. There's the shock and there's normal heart rhythm. Okay, that's from a defibrillator. This is kind of a, a really, uh, a really crazy video. You're gonna see this uh, athlete in Europe during a soccer game suddenly collapse, goes into cardiac arrest. His device shocks him, rescues his life, watch his legs kick. The device is there, shocks and brings him back to life. Patient gets up and now he wants to go and go back on the field and play, just saved his life. So these devices are real and these really do improve survival in the patients that are highest risk for this. These are other things that we do. And now for the next 10 or 15, 20 minutes, I really wanna focus now that you've had an understanding of all the different kinds of things that can go wrong, this arrhythmia called atrial fibrillation. And what you're seeing here in this little picture is a picture of the heart. And like you saw earlier with the normal system, you, you, you saw one little red dot that went from the upper chamber, the atrium, all the way down to the lower chamber. And on this picture, you see there's complete chaos happening in the upper chamber because in atrial fibrillation, there's a short circuit in the atrium. This is the most common arrhythmia in practice. Uh, and you know about a third of patients really feel bad when they have this. A third of patients don't feel anything at all and a third of patients are kind of feeling something is off, but aren't too symptomatic. So you have lots of different ways this manifests uh, in patients. And that's what we'll talk about. Remember the lifetime risk of AFib is fairly high for individuals over the age of 40 in the United States based on the Framingham study, the likelihood of anyone developing AFib was one in four, okay? If you look for that compared to a woman uh, for breast cancer is one in eight, hip fracture is one in six, not that we're equating them all, but just to give you perspective of incidence of, these, of this arrhythmia, it's fairly common, it's related to aging, okay? And when you look at the population, uh, US population, you see the number of patients that are older, you see in the blue bar, the red is the total number of patients, uh, but it, uh, of people alive in this country in different ages, but the blue bar is the age group that gets the AFib. So even though there's less people of that age, that's the age group where we see atrial fib because AFib is typically a process of aging. When people, people reach 70, it's nearly 10% of the population. And the big issue is a connection between AFib uh, and stroke. And this is, the, this is the challenge that we have is trying to balance the two, okay? So here you see the upper chamber is quivering. It's in fibrillation. And so what does that mean? Well, it's beating irregularly. It's beating at 400, 500 beats a minute. Okay, and so what's happening uh, is that uh, the blood clots are forming inside the atrium because it's beating at such a rapid and irregular rate, it's not squeezing. And then what happens when you get a blood clot in the atrium is that this blood, blood clot can break free. And then it goes along the course of the blood and, and a third of all your blood goes up to your brain. And so if this blood clot goes up directly into the brain, what's going to happen is it's going to go further and further until that blood clot blocks the flow of blood in, in a certain branch. As you can see, this blood clot is passing along, minding its own business, but it's always going to be bigger than a blood cell. And eventually, as the arteries get narrower and narrower and narrower, the blood clot is going to block, and it depends just randomly what branch it goes down, it's going to block blood flow. And within a second, your brain cells, your neurons start dying. And this is a stroke that comes from atrial fibrillation. And 25% of all strokes come from atrial fibrillation, 80% of which are preventable because a lot of these patients either didn't know that they had atrial fib or didn't have symptoms and hadn't seen their doctor. And so their first symptom is that of a stroke. Okay. So now when we look a little bit at stroke here. I'm trying to see this is typing something for me and I've never really seen this kind of a, a thing with the slides. But if we talk about stroke, it is the third leading cause of death. And, and like I said, you know, AFib is a big part of why patients have stroke and that's what we're gonna focus on. But it's a leading cause of long-term disability. And when I ask patients, you know, when I talk about stroke, most patients say, you know what, at being older, being over 75, to me, stroke is worse than death. I don't want to be in a scenario where I'm paralyzed, where I need a feeding tube, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I want to make sure I minimize my risk 
of having stroke. Uh, and in the US, like I said, one person dies every 30 seconds from cardiac arrest. Well, another person suffers a stroke every 45 seconds. So, you know, 80% of these strokes, like we said, are preventable because if you were to treat the arrhythmia and treat the atrial fibrillation, then you could really minimize the chances and risk of someone having stroke with right therapy. So how do we reduce that risk of stroke in atrial fibrillation? I think it's important to know that one of the most preventable ways of reducing the risk of stroke in patients with AFib is by putting them on an anticoagulant, what we commonly refer to as blood thinners. Remember, aspirin and Plavix and clopidogrel, these are not considered blood thinners. They make the blood less sticky. But the real blood thinners are anticoagulants, which actually reduce the chances of clotting. Okay, those are known as Coumadin or Warfarin, then Pradaxa, uh, Dabigatran, Xeralto, uh, Rivaroxaban, Eliquis, or Apixaban. These are the actual blood thinners that can significantly reduce the risk of stroke in patients who have atrial fibrillation. And really, if you look at strokes, they really do as a, a, a to, as a function of age. So the older you are, uh, the more likely you're gonna have a stroke with AFib relative to the younger patient, because the older you are, the less functional your atrium is and the more likely you're gonna form clots. And so it's important that in the older population, we get more aggressive uh, than we are in treating them for AFib. And the problem with this slide is that it's the 80 to 89 year old, the 70 to 79 year old, these are the patients that we as clinicians and physicians and allied health professionals and nurse practitioners, physician assistants, all of us, we are less likely to actually put these types of patients on the therapy that they need because we feel like, oh, this person's older, they may fall, uh, they're on so many medications, they may get confused, and we're doing them a disservice. In the United States, 40% of patients who have atrial fibrillation who are high risk for stroke are not on the medications they need to reduce their risk. Now, this may be legitimate. The person may have had a significant bleed, or this may be just because we're scared, but I think it's really important that we recognize and admit that and try to figure out other ways to reduce their risk of stroke. And so when we look at that, this is a little uh, uh, drawing of the, of the heart, of one specific side of the heart, the left side of the heart. In the top, you see the atrium, and the arrow is showing how the blood goes down to the lower chamber, the muscle or the ventricle, which then squeezes it out to the body. So it goes out, down and out, and out to the right, if you imagine. Now, the reason most people get blood clots is in this pouch here called the appendix or the appendage of the heart. We're all familiar with the appendix in the gut, but we uh, often... Uh, don't talk about the appendage or appendix attached to the heart. It's something that we're born with. It's an embryologic remnant. And this is where we typically see blood clots. Here's an ultrasound showing a blood clot in that pouch. It looks like an apple hanging off of a tree. Unfortunately, very soon after this image, the patient had a stroke uh, within even a few hours of this because the patient was hospitalized. I started them on blood thinners, was calling the surgeon to see whether we need to take this out because it was dangling and it embolized uh, and it caused a stroke. And this is an example when heart surgeons do open heart surgery and they cut this out, look at the massive blood clot that was an inch long that came out of this person's appendage. Here you see an ultrasound showing again, a round ball right here in the center, which is in that appendage, um, which uh, you know, if one of us was to do a procedure or, or give them an electrical shock to try to reset their AFib, or just leave this untreated if we didn't know this patient was very high risk of having a stroke. And so what is a therapy, something that we're kind of world famous for here at this institution outside of ablation uh, is this therapy called Watchman. We have been involved since 2005 in the first trials and have enrolled the most patients in any of those clinical trials worldwide uh, in the special therapy, which is now FDA approved uh, to be an alternative to taking blood thinners and protecting patients from stroke. And what we do is we go in through the vein and we enter into the heart. And as we enter into the heart, we uh, advance this catheter up uh, and into the heart uh, and basically advance this catheter and make a small little puncture hole across uh, this membrane. 
and get into the left side of the heart where that appendage is. And what we studied was the ability to close this pouch with a simple device, kind of like corking a wine bottle. And the study showed that for those patients who aren't able to take blood thinners well because they're older, they're frail, they fall, they're concerned, this pouch, which comes in many different shapes, as you see, can be closed. And the data shows is that closing this pouch uh, has uh, worked well in terms of reducing one's risk of stroke relative to what it would be if you weren't on any blood thinners. So for those patients who are challenged, who feel they either cannot because they don't tolerate it or they're missing doses or they have side effects uh, or they're bleeding, this Watchman procedure where we're putting this little device, which we can move around and fit right to the right position, uh, which will then seal this pouch. So it's a one-time procedure where we're able to, to put this device in, which will seal and close off this pouch. Uh, and then what happens is your body grows its own tissue over it. So it's almost like when you have a freeway and you put a roadblock sign so the cars don't take the off-ramp and they stay on the highway because it's a dead-end street on the off-ramp. We're closing off this pouch where the clots come from. And in these patients, they are off of anticoagulants or blood thinners in a short period after the device is put in. And the studies have shown that for the patients who are not going to be able to take the blood thinners, who are not taking them, this device is very effective uh, in reducing their risk of stroke. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we move forward. So as I mentioned, we have one of the world's largest experience with, with this procedure. Uh, one of the things that we really specialize in relative to 95% of the places in the country is that we uh, are very proficient at doing this procedure without needing anesthesia. So in most other places, the patients are done with anesthesia. They get a tube put down their throat. Uh, they do ultrasound from that tube also. Um, and that's how they do the procedure. But you can imagine if you're 80 or 90 years old, which is really the type of patient this procedure was designed for, the 70, 80, 90 year olds, then you know, to be under general anesthesia and be paralyzed and put under anesthesia is a pretty big deal. And if we can do the procedure from the vein without requiring any significant sedation, and just something to relax them, but patients are wide awake um, and, and most of those patients can go home the same day, we're making a really huge impact in our patient's ability to, to undergo the procedure. Now, moving into the next generation thing, I wanna to talk to you about some really unique concepts of, of uh, gene manipulation within the heart uh, to basically try to improve your own internal pacemaker without having to put one in. This is in a zebrafish. And the zebrafish, you can see there, we can actually see their heart, okay? And so you can see the heart beating. So here you see the heart beating, uh, and we have special equipment that we can monitor the, the activation of the heart and see the pattern of it and see how it's going. And by, by inserting certain vectors into the DNA of these cells, we can actually take a heart that's beating very slowly in the left and make it beat faster. So could you imagine in the future, uh, now this is, may not even be in my lifetime, but where we could you know, insert some vector by giving you a shot or something and suddenly we can make your own internal pacemaker work better so you don't actually need an implanted device. This is the future of technology. So in conclusion, Heart rhythm disorders are the most common cardiac abnormalities, but fortunately, many are benign, but many are also curable. And the challenge is that the symptoms vary, especially in women who have very atypical symptoms. And when it comes to atrial fibrillation, which is the most common arrhythmia in practice, we at St. John's uh, are pioneering and, and not just leaders locally in, in, in West Los Angeles or in Santa Monica, but not just in California or in the United States, but in the world, uh, we have really pioneered some, some novel therapies and, and are able to offer our patients this kind of technology at what we call a so-called community hospital. So whether we need to fix the AFib, whether we need to protect you from stroke, or whether we need to just say, listen, everything is fine the way it is, we don't have to do anything. Uh, these, these are things that I think it's really important for patients to see a specialist in atrial fib because the technologies are so diverse and so many options that a general physician or cardiologist may not be uh, aware of all the latest and greatest things we can do. So with that, I'm gonna to jump to the Q&A here and uh, see some of the questions here. So uh, one question came up, 
Uh, I have a mechanical valve and intermittent atrial fibrillation. I'm always aware of the valve and feel it beating and pounding in my chest. How do I tell the difference between this kind of pounding and the pounding that may be happening in AFib? And that's a great question. Sometimes you can. I mean, people have a mechanical valve, hear the clicking. And so they hear every single heartbeat clicking. And when they go out of rhythm, the clicking becomes very irregular versus something that's really steady and clicking. Now, the reality is, does this need to be treated? Because if you have a mechanical valve, you have to be on a blood thinner anyway because of the mechanical valve. So that's going to treat the a stroke risk from atrial fibrillation. Now, there are patients who have mechanical valves who don't feel well when they have a complete short circuit like atrial fib, and sometimes we have to go in and fix that too. But as long as it's not affecting your quality of life and you're living with it and, it's, and you're able to do what you want, then regardless of whether you have skipped beats or whether you have atrial fib, as long as you're protected from stroke, you can live with it. And that's why it's a very individual decision in terms of what to do. It depends, you know, patient to patient, depending on how it affects them. Uh, there's a question here. How soon can I get back to normal life after undergoing procedures like the Watchman? Well, what's great about the Watchman is if you do it the, the St. John's way or our way, which is without anesthesia uh, and with uh, just light sedation, because we don't have to put anything down your throat, then, you know, I tell patients when they go home, that you don't feel better, you don't feel worse. You feel exactly as you did when you came in. And when you go home a few hours later, you're going to feel exactly the same. All we're doing is replacing your blood thinner or, or protecting you from stroke so you don't have to take a blood thinner. But there's very minimal recovery needed. Um, you know, you go home the same day and pretty much you're, you're back to normal. Uh, you might be a little bit sore in your vein, you know, in your thigh that we went to access but that re recovers very quickly. So it's not like other procedures where there's a long, prolonged recovery time. Let's see, now we have uh, one question. I have SVT, does this make me vulnerable for stroke? So SVT, for those of you uh, who have uh, uh, heard of this, it stands for supraventricular tachycardia. So tachycardia means it's rapid heartbeats, typically more than 100. And supraventricular means it's coming from the top chamber of the heart. And SVT generally does, means that it's a, a short circuit that's not atrial fib. When we say SVT, we're specifically saying not atrial fib. And so that's how I'm going to refer to it. So I'm hoping that it's not atrial fib. When it's just SVT, then that does not necessarily increase one's risk for stroke, unlike AFib. So it's a different type of short circuit, uh, which typically does not cause blood clots. But if you have SVT and if you have a lot of it, then colleagues like myself, electrophysiologists, we can fix those. And there's no reason for one to live with SVT unless they're rare and infrequent. But if they're happening a lot and they're causing a lot of symptoms, then it would be something that I would recommend getting treatment for that could potentially be fixed. Next question. Uh, if you have AFib and undergo an ablation procedure, can you go off blood thinners? What is the recovery time? and success rate uh, versus Watchman, would you recommend one over the other? So that's a great question. I think we wanna separate the two types of procedures. Ablation is actually trying to fix the AFib, okay? The Watchman is where you say, well, the AFib doesn't bother me, so I don't need to try to fix it. Let me just get off the blood thinners because that's really my issue. And so the patients who really should get an ablation are the ones that feel the atrial fib who don't feel well. It's not that their pulse is a little bit off, they generally don't feel well. They're more tired, they're more fatigued when they have it, you know, et cetera, or they're, the palpitation, they're short of breath. If you don't feel well, then we really should try to fix your AFib with an ablation procedure. And depending on what your risk of stroke is, if your risk of stroke is low and we can fix the AFib, then absolutely you can get off blood thinners. Uh, if you've had a stroke, then we're always nervous about taking off blood thinners because sometimes, the ablation is not 100% and people can have recurrent episodes of arrhythmia and need to have a second touch-up procedure. So the difference with a watchman is a watchman, we say, okay, well, we can decide whether you need an ablation or not, but you know, Mr. Jones or Mrs. Jones, your main issue is that you're at risk for stroke and you can't take blood thinner. So we're gonna put the watchman in or you're not taking him. And then you don't have to, uh, you know, you don't have the same risk of stroke. Your risk of stroke is lowered and you're not on a blood thinner. 
But if you really feel bad from the atrial fib, we may end up doing an ablation procedure later. So there's two separate things. A watchman is to reduce the risk of stroke without taking blood thinners. And ablation is to make people feel better who feel bad when they have AFib. And ablation takes a little more recovery time. Sometimes it takes a week or two for people to kind of feel, uh, you know, feel like they're back to themselves. They're all outpatient procedures typically. But with the watchman, since we're simply putting in that little device, you don't feel any different. Ablation takes sometimes a little time for recovery. Uh, next one. Uh, I am... Uh, I have a pacemaker and a blood thinner. When I get older, is it worthwhile to change the pacemaker? So a pacemaker is there to make your heart beat when it's beating too slow. And so obviously if you're using the pacemaker, when the battery gets slow, you wanna have it replaced because otherwise your pulse is gonna get slow again and you're not gonna feel good. And you know the assumption is that's why you had the pacemaker in the first place because there was something wrong with your pulse. And so I think, you know, it's important when you, you know, to follow up with your electrician, electrophysiologist, to know when it's time to change your pacemaker if you're really using it. Now, if you're on a blood thinner because you have atrial fib and you have some trouble taking it or you're, you're falling or you're frail, then maybe a watchman is an option um, to replace the blood thinner in that specific circumstance. But there's a lot of things that we have to know before we would commit to that. Um, here we have an anonymous attendee asking, with all of these new treatments, are the options preferred or better than taking regular medications? Well, I think, I think it really depends. For example, if you're someone who is relatively otherwise healthy or, or only having some issues some of the time, then these treatments can be often be curative. They can really fix the problem, at least for the next 5, 10, 15 years. And as long you have to weigh the risk of the procedure versus the benefit. If you're someone who is at high risk from having complications from the procedure, then it may not be worth it. But if the risk is low and the likelihood of success is high, then many of us believe that it's better to get it fixed than stay on long-term medication. So I think you know that's a very loaded question, and it and it varies depending on the patients and what their other medical problems are. But definitely worth considering. If you see the right, if you see a skilled electrophysiologist who specializes in these therapies we talked about, uh, and you know, like for example, my colleagues or are, are, are the people here at St. John's, then I think you might get a really good answer. And, and and from what I can tell you is that we are generally very um, you know thoughtful and not dogmatic in that you know not every procedure is for everybody. So I think it really matters, and you know that leads to the question. What are the success rates for women with ablation? And is there a difference in success rate with ablation with those people who are having AFib only some of the time, what we call paroxysmal AFib? And so what you'll realize is that the success rates with ablation are highly physician dependent. Depends on who does your procedure and depends on the technique they use. So that's one thing. The other thing that matters is, you know, when your AFib is only occurring some of the time called paroxysmal, then your success rate's higher versus someone who's been in AFib for three years who now wants to get it fixed. So, you know, women and men have similar success rates depending on what type of AFib that they have. More important is your age, how big is the atrium, how much AFib do you have, do you have any other medical problems like valve problems, all these things impact, you know, whether you're going to have a successful procedure. But if you go to the right place with the right people who are honest, they can help you make an informed decision about what's right for you. But in general, for, from my perspective, all patients who have intermittent AFib called paroxysmal AFib have a very high chance of having a success from a procedure. So those patients, we would generally recommend having a procedure done versus staying on lifelong medications. All right, so we're 45 minutes in. Uh, Christina, I don't see any other questions here. Um, I'm happy to stay a little bit longer, but I think we've had a really good discussion and I was impressed at the questions that were asked by the audience because, um, you know, they were very relevant. It means that you know, everyone was paying attention. Wonderful. And thank you, Dr. Dr. Dosh, for this wonderful and informative discussion. I learned a lot, I know, so this was really exciting to hear and be a part of. And thank you to all of our participants for taking the time to listen and to ask questions. And a big thank you again to our expert for taking the time to provide us with this valuable information. 
uh, we'll be sending out a recording for everyone if they'd like to view this again after the fact and uh, maybe ask some follow-up questions to Dr. Doshi as well. And if you'd like to follow up with us uh, for any additional information, please call 310-829-7678. And thank you again and have a wonderful rest of your week. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.